haven't been to the Belt Couturin Museum, I will um, urge you to go there and see some of the objects that I'm talking about today. Um, this is my alternative start, but this was the uh, original one I had. Um, that is the topic uh, of today, Melanesian rituals, Melanesian art. Um, last week I presented a theoretical overview of my lectures on the history of the Western transformation of ethnographic artifacts into fine art. And I situated the lectures theoretically uh, with reference to Bourdieu's concept of art as a field of cultural production characterized by social relations, beliefs, institutions. I also explained that in order to understand the development of primitive art, and I'm going to just ask them to raise this a little bit, um, that uh, we've had to first consider the prehistory of primitive art, the um, chronology, that is, of the different taxonomic moments um, that preceded Westerners' classification of non-Western objects as important art. Although this history may be familiar to many of you, would you like to <laughs> adjust this? It's kind of going all over the place. Um, as I said, although this history may be familiar to many of you, um, through uh, either your um, various experiences that you've had through museums, through your study of the history of anthropology and its relationship to museums and material culture, I expect, or I hope, that for some of you, um, this history of key taxonomic moments, here I'm adopting a term uh, I mentioned last week from the historian James Clifford, um, is not fully known in all of its contours. And for those of you more familiar with this history, I hope that the emphasis that I'll be putting in uh, subsequent lectures um, on this history of people and events as it happened in the United States, sometimes simultaneously, um, sometimes a decade or so later than what was going on in Europe, but with a decidedly American twist, will be illuminating and will provide a broader horizon for already familiar terrain. Today, however, unlike the remainder of my lectures, I'm going to put on my ethnographer's hat rather than being a cultural historian. Uh, using material from Melanesia, uh, let's see which way I want to go. OK. There we go. Uh, just to get you off to the part of the world that we're going to be talking about, um, which is the part of the world that I'm most familiar with ethnographically, I'm going to be focusing on the indigenous meaning of art objects um, because I think it's important um, before we go off talking about Westerners and um, this broad topic uh, that I'll generally be referring to as quote unquote primitive art, uh, or ethnographic artifacts, um, I think it's important that we um, think about some of these objects individually and they were all produced by indigenous artists for specific events and purposes. Um, and this point was made very clear to me this weekend uh, when I went to the Weltkulturen Museum to see the current exhibit there. Uh, on trading style. I was particularly struck by the comments that Carrie Munden, a designer from um, the London-based cassette player, made about her interaction with the objects from the museum's collection. Um, she was particularly interested, she said, in the meaning of these objects. That She talked with uh, Ava Rob about many of the objects from Melanesia. Um, and uh, it was not only the design and the form of these objects that inspired her, um, but it was also their use um, and the indigenous meanings of the objects. So to um, go. So here, uh, for those of you who have seen the exhibit, this will be familiar to you. 
um, for those who haven't, maybe it'll tantalize you to go see the exhibit. Um, the, here is a yacht mole uh, from the Sibig region of New Guinea, a statue as well as um, a bride's headdress, and here is an object that uh, was inspired by uh, the bride's uh, headdress. Um, so, um, Carrie, just to uh, continue with uh, some of her comments, um, she was also interested in the rituals associated, for example, with male initiation, uh, which provoked her to wonder about the impact of the loss of such coming-of-age rituals among today's urban youth. So, I will be talking about some of these rituals um, as we continue today. So another reason why I'm focusing on uh, indigenous meaning of objects today is because um, these meanings demonstrate so clearly what Walter Benjamin, uh, his concept that I talked about last week of the cult value of art, um, by which he meant value ascribed to works of art that derives from their association with religion and rituals. So this is a plane of value um, that is the polar opposite of the exhibitionary value of art, which these same objects exemplify when they become primitive art. So ironically, uh, perhaps, when primitive art became established in the West as a category of art that collectors bought and sold, um, that is, once it became a commodity, that had exchange value, as well as this exhibitionary value that um, uh, <coughs> Benjamin was talking about. Its uh, commodity value was, and to a certain extent still is, if you look at the auction uh, catalogs, dependent upon whether or not the object had actually been used by its creators in a religious context. If it had, it was considered to be more, quote unquote, authentic. Uh, than objects that did not have traditional cult value. And thus its Western exchange value, as well as its exhibitionary value, increased. So finally, another goal is to show the usefulness of Alfred Gell's theory of art as a technology of enchantment that I began to talk about last week, and the ways in which art objects function as social agents. All of the objects I'll be discussing can be found in museums here in Germany, right here in Frankfurt, as well as in the United States. Um, so you may recognize and have seen examples of them already, uh, or have worked with them, as some of you as curators. Um, I'm going to focus on three specific culture areas in Melanesia. So let's see. Um, so, zooming in a little bit from that big map of the Pacific, we get to the area, the culture area of the world that anthropologists and art historians refer to as Melanesia. Um, I'm going to be then uh, getting even more specifically. Um, I found a, a map that has some uh, German identification of these uh, areas that we'll, I'll be talking about. So, I'm going to be looking at uh, Northern uh, New Ireland, the Sepik River, which is the area where I've worked, and the Ozmai, which was uh, formerly known as Erie and Jaya, or West Papua, the western portion of the island of New Guinea. Um, although each of these three areas have produced distinct artistic styles, and in the Sepik region in particular, a vast array uh, of different styles concentrated in one area, there are some aesthetic and material characteristics that are common to all of them. So, I'm going to list three things. These include the prevalence of wooden sculptures as containers for the manifestation of supernatural spirits, so a lot of uh, sculpture. Uh, the symbolic importance of paint and three, the role of objects within a ritual context that often includes performance uh, of dancing and chanting, singing. So, we'll begin with uh, Northern New Ireland. And I, I wanted to say one thing about my choice of these three areas because I, it was rather coincidental. 
Um, I had chosen these three areas to talk about um, before I had read in detail Jell's book, Art and Agency. So I was very surprised to find out that uh, Mollingans are very important uh, to his argument. Uh, and he also refers to the Asma as well. So um, I will be uh, quoting Jell's uh, specifically uh, on some of these uh, objects. Um, the intricately carved and painted sculptures, and here's an example of one, from northern New Ireland, um, are commonly referred to using a Neo-Melanesian, or uh, locally Tukpisan term, Malangan. Um, they're some of the most colorful sculptures uh, produced by Pacific Islanders. The term Malangan refers both to the sculptures themselves, the objects, and to the funerary rituals for which the sculptures are produced and displayed. There are reportedly about 5,000 of these objects called Malangans in Western museums. It's a lot. Uh, making them one of the commonest collectible in the West. And one reason why that's so um, is that once they're produced and ritually displayed, they're no longer of any interest to uh, the New Islanders who produced them themselves. The object no longer has some kind of ritual or cult value for them, um, nor an exhibitionary value for them either. Uh, a second reason is that Westerners have long known about this region of Melanesia. Our earliest images of the area, and this is uh, our earliest uh, image, um, uh, comes from the Dutch explorer, Alla in 1643. And this, uh, what you see here, is an engraving that was made from sketches drawn by an artist who accompanied Tasman on his voyage. And in this drawing, we see three New Ireland men in their outrigger canoe, very typical of this area of the Pacific, this type of canoe. Um, and it's adorned with an elaborate uh, both prow and stern ornaments. So, and then this propeller-like object that you see here and here um, were used by these men in um, hunting sharks, fishing for uh, sharks. Uh, there's a, a fascinating um, ethnographic film made about these, uh, uh, the practice, the contemporary practice of catching sharks this way by an Australian filmmaker um, called Shark Collars of Cantu. Uh, so the illustration was published in Tasman's journal uh, and was one of the earliest images of oceanic art to be seen in the West. However, the island acquired its name not surprisingly, from an English navigator, Philip Carteret, who visited there more than 100 years later, in 1767. Uh, it continued to be called New Ireland uh, by the Germans when they claimed it as a South Seas colony, though sometimes it's also referred to as Neumecklenburg on maps, um, when they claimed it in 1884. And the Germans established extensive uh, coconut plantations uh, on New Ireland and the smaller neighboring islands of New Hanover, De Beer, and Lahir. Uh, the next image that I have is actually a, a more contemporary canoe prow, just to give you some ideas of um, the uh, more recent designs um, uh, being used by the New Islanders. And here's another one. Uh, and this image I find uh, really fascinating. Um, it's speculated that perhaps the reason the man has his hands behind his ears is that he's being involved with the calling uh, of the sharks. Um, there are magical um, um, spells that the shark callers, the uh, men, um, use to lure the sharks to them, as well as that um, piece of equipment that I showed you. Um, so, let's see. Here is a map of the area that I'm talking about then, the northern part of uh, New Ireland. And um, 
Although British missionaries from the London Missionary Society had been working in New Ireland since the early 19th century, it was only after the Germans arrived that we began to get more information about the elaborate masks, headdresses, and sculptures that along with the dances, songs, and costumes form the ceremonial complexes, and I'm talking about Malangan. Um, and here we have an object that was collected by uh, one of the um, German plantation uh, overseers, a man named Parkinson. Different types of Malangans accompany various stages of a person's life from infancy until death. However, the most elaborate of the Malangans are commissioned by living relatives to commemorate the dead. This is often a year or more after their death when people have had enough time to accumulate um, the food and the other um, money, basically, today that's uh, needed to commission uh, the carving of one of these. Uh, so given the great expense involved with procuring and displaying Malangan, several in individuals may be honored with a display uh, of the sculptures at the same time. Uh, a small structure is um, uh, constructed, and then the Malangans are put on display. Um, as I said afterwards, the sculptures and the structure are simply allowed to disintegrate. Uh, for what was most important was the moment of their display and celebration when the uh, supernatural spirit of the life force of the um, deceased who's being honored, Malangun, was said to have temporarily inhabited uh, the, the structure. Once the spirits of the dead are said to depart, the sculptor itself is ritually killed with uh, gifts of uh, money from people who have come, shell money, uh, to view the Malangan. The right to commission a carver to make a particular Malangan must be inherited or purchased either from one's relatives or from one's spouse's clan. Uh, societies in this region are matrilineal. And the specific designs on a Malangan are in a sense copyrighted and owned by individuals, but then can be transferred after the uh, necessary payment has been made. So men compete with one another to acquire the right to commission as many Malangan as possible in order to establish their prestige and political authority within the clan and community. So I think you can begin to see here in some of the things that I'm talking about, um, some of Jell's idea of agency at work. These objects actually do something. They're creating social relationships among individuals. The individual design elements that make up a particular Malangan relate to specific clan myths. But first of all, I want to show you uh, two men um, who, uh, one is a carver and the other is someone who has commissioned one of the Malangan. Um, so this is a living tradition that's still uh, going on today. Um, and in this next image, uh, you see some of the uh, different kinds of um, uh, carving and designs that go on. And, but you'll begin to see that there is um, a, a stylistic similarity among them. Um, the individual design elements that make up the Malangan relate to specific clan myths and clan-affiliated spirits, birds, snakes, fish, and a limited number of other natural and <coughs> supernatural elements. Thus, embedded within the design of a specific sculpture, mask, or headdress, here, show another, um, is a specific clan history. So um, the uh, Malangan itself is said to represent a skin, and, or as you is referred to by the term skin. Um, and skin has another meaning uh, besides the material that encloses our bodies. Uh, skin also refers to Athenal clan relations, so to your kin through marriage. Uh, so what you're seeing represented in any um, complex of images in one of these Malangans then is also a representation of a set of relationships among people. 
Moreover, the process of creating a Malangan sculpture entails ritual itself, whereby the carver of the figure transforms an ordinary piece of wood into a representation, as I said before, in which the life force of the deceased inhabits. Um, Susanna Kukler, who has written extensively uh, about the Malangan, talks about it acting somewhat like a battery, where all the energy that had been part of the, um, the wealth, the social activities, and the social relations of the person who's represented by this um, Malangan uh, is gathered together in the Malangan. And then, interestingly enough, it gets dispersed at the end of the ritual to all of the individuals who have made a payment to view that um, Malangan because they have some kind of kin relation to it. Uh, so this is another way in which um, Jell's idea, and I'm not going to go into this in more detail, but for those of you who have read um, Marilyn Strathern's work uh, called The Gender of the Gift, in which she talks about the idea of the individual, uh, rather than a Western notion of an individual, she talks about a Melanesian notion of the person, of personhood being both made up of all of the social relations that have contributed to that individual's life, and that at the time of death, that person then becomes divisible, and the actual social relations and property and clan totems and other um, social relations of that individual are then distributed to the living. Uh, so, for um, Jell, this was a very exciting uh, a concept for him to see objectified in a Malin gun, which an idea that he was working on in terms of his theory of art. That art was not just a set of semiotic uh, relations, it wasn't just a form of communication, art actually does something. It is the doing. And that these Malangan then, their doing is they're passing on to the recipients uh, of the um, viewing of the Malangan, uh, the, uh, what we might say in, our, in Western terms, the inheritance of social relations and other rights to things. And it's the object then, the creating of the object that brings all of those things together and then, for those individuals who want to make a claim to having some part, some partable part of that person who's deceased, they then bring gifts of shell money to that structure that I showed you. Uh, and then they have the right to view the Mongan and to remember it. And this is an idea that um, Susanna Kugler has described very, in very um, uh, detailed terms in the ethnography that she's written about Malanga in the area where she worked in New Ireland, the importance of memory. And so uh, memory in this case is based upon having been, having viewed that Malanga, having the right to view it, and having the right to um, the memory of having seen it, and therefore in the future, having the right to lay claim to the relationships that were embodied in uh, the Malangan. And one of the things that I thought about uh, after uh, reading what both Kukler and Jell were talking about is how um, s socially important it might be that the Malangan itself isn't kept. I mean, in our own culture, we might, we'll have a will, or we'll have a deed, and we'll store it away somewhere. It's very important that you have that evidence. In New Ireland societies, there's a certain ambiguity that then develops uh, by the fact that the object uh, dies, and the object, uh, in that sense, uh, disappears. Um, so there's also 
than the room for change in the future and manipulation and political intrigue around these claims that are being made by those people who viewed that image. So I'll just leave that um, for you to uh, ponder in some way uh, in terms of the actual social relations that are engendered. Um, but let's go back then to the Mollenbun themselves. Um, the range of animals depicted in Mollenbun sculptures is smaller, as I said earlier, than what's really what's found in the environment, the social world of the uh, New Irelanders, um, and they uh, encode important aspects of the social structure. So uh, here's. Uh, All people living in Northern New Ireland are members of two moieties known as hawk and eagle. So you see one or the other of these represented in these objects. People also belong to smaller kin-based groups, each of which is associated with a totemic bird, snake, or fish. So here you see um, a bird, here you see um, a, a, another um, bird, probably a hawk that's eating a snake. Uh, significantly, these uh, uh, animals also represent the earth, air, and sea. So between the birds with the air, the snake with the earth, and the fish with the sea, you have different combinations then that relate to the environment and then the transformations uh, between these different uh, parts of the physical world. Not only do different Mongan motifs represent different social groups, but different types of Mongan are associated with different phases of an individual's death. Thus, for example, ho these horizontal Mongan that I've been showing you um, are seen um, for, the, the, for the first display soon after an individual has died. Another horizontal mullen gun shows, uh, let me get to this one, um, shows a fish with a small human figure here at the end. Um, and it's thought that this might uh, recognize, might signify that the deceased died at sea. Um, within this visual vocabulary of form, certain themes recur with great frequency. Um, one of the most common, as I showed you earlier, was the um, bird and the snake engaged in a struggle. Uh, as one scholar has pointed out about these sculptures, struggling or swallowing, although it could be interpreted as conflict between uh, cosmic realms, seems more probably to suggest transition or mediation between uh, two forms a literal incorporation of one into the other. Thus, for example, in the canoe prow ornament that we saw earlier, the man with his uh, hands behind his ears, the depiction of a man uh, in a shark's mouth may relate to magical practices of men skilled in hunting uh, sharks, as well as to New Ireland ideas about the transposition of the souls of the deceased to sharks. Sometime later, often several years later, the more elaborate vertical mullen gun, okay, uh, and here I had, just to remind you of that the new graphic image again. Um, so we've seen the horizontal mullen gun, now we're looking at the vertical, uh, the, which are more elaborate, um, will be commissioned and put on display, again, in a special enclosed structure. Um, Another local variation of Mongan can be found. Well, let me show you some more of these vertical uh, examples first. This is one that uh, is in the museum, uh, the Metropolitan Museum of Art that belonged to Nelson Rockefeller. This is one that's uh, in Los Angeles. Um, it, uh, you can go and see many examples of them here said in uh, uh, Germany. Uh, I haven't been here myself, but others of you may be able to tell me this, but I've heard that Stuttgart has a particularly good collection of New Ireland uh, Mountain. <clears throat> so, uh, 
the last, um, here we go, here's one of the structures. This one is a photograph from back in 1930. So uh, you can see that there was um, quite a number of these Mullen guns that were um, commissioned and put on display. And uh, another, uh, this is actually from Stuttgart, uh, another type of Mullen gun is called uh, uh, a soul boat um, with many of the uh, objects of the Mullen gun actually set in the canoe. And then the final thing that I'd like to show you is um, these carvings that would have been put at the back of one of these structures. So you can see not only would you have had the vertical um, uh, carvings, but you could also uh, in, more, in an elaborate setup have had um, individual panels commissioned representing the deceased as well. Uh, and then this, uh, this image I wanted to show you in contrast to the photograph from 1930, this is a more recent um, Mullen gun display. And here you see that they've incorporated elements of Christianity. So, um, as I mentioned earlier, I said that these are uh, living tradition, but it's been, there's been syncretism in which elements of Christianity then are included along with uh, the uh, traditional ideas of Malangan. And then finally, um, a local variation in another part of New Ireland are these uh, helmet uh, masks called Tatanua. And um, they're used as dance headdresses. So the term, uh, like Malangan, Tatanua, refers both to the mask itself, the object, and to the dance performed by the men wearing the masks. Um, and I wanted to uh, point out here this element. I need a point. If you see the circle here, that's actually from a piece of cloth um, that was. Uh, incorporated into the traditional mask. So uh, the, um, and that uh, symbol is called the Eye of Fire. And uh, you see the same Eye of Fire design in such things as these um, uh, cup cup ornaments uh, that would have been worn around the neck. Um, and there are uh, many of these that are on display uh, at the Belt Culture uh, Museum here. Um, but to go back to the dances, uh, here are two dancers. This photograph was uh, made in 1979, wearing the Tapanua uh, masks. Uh, and here you can see more contemporary elements, um, uh, store-bought yarn that's been incorporated into these uh, masks. This picture was taken uh, in the late 1990s. So uh, let me just conclude what I want to um, say in terms of the Malangan. It, uh, as I mentioned, that it turns out that Jell had a lot to say about them. Um, and uh, the Malangan, according to Jell, mediate and transmit relationships, that is, agency, between past and future generations. And I talked about the way in which the skin is a representation uh, of these ethnal relationships, and it's those relationships then that are transmitted through the Malangan to junior members of the community. Um, purchasing the right to have a Malangan made as well as having made a gift of shell money at the time of the display, procures for the donors the right to remember the display of Malangans. As Jell explains, it is this internalized memory of the image, parceled out among the contributors to the ceremony, which constitutes the ceremonial asset, entitling the possessor to social privileges which are transmitted at the mortuary ceremony from the senior to the junior generations. Thus, Jell says, art objects, in this case the Malangan, can be seen to substitute for persons and act as social agents. This, for Jell, is his most exciting insight into the function of art, how objects can empower human agency. 
and enabled, as well as instantiate social relations. Let us now uh, turn to the Cedic region. And again, what I'm um, hoping to do is through each of these um, discussions of um, a couple of other uh, culture areas in New Guinea, show you some uh, variations on this same idea of the uh, way in which these art objects uh, uh, imbue agency or engender agency. So, uh, the Sepik region uh, is not only the longest river in New Guinea, here's a picture uh, of the river itself, a map of it, uh, it's over 700 miles in length, it's also one of the great rivers of the world. It was originally named, and hear me correct my German, Kaiserin Augustus Fluss, uh, by those Germans who first saw it in 1909-1910. And it's uh, home to a great variety of cultures. I'm going to put up a uh, quote here. Um, that was uh, made by two anthropologists, uh, or an anthropologist, Ralph Linton, and an art historian, Paul Wimbert. Um, uh, this is a quote from an exhibit that I'll be talking about later in the lectures, um, The Art of the South Seas at the Museum of Modern Art in 1946. So they said that the variety of Sepik uh, River art is one of its chief characteristics. Since the elaborate religious and social ceremonies required great display of carved and painted objects, there was an ever-present need for new paraphernalia, similar to the situation with the Mullingen. And this gave rise to a technical proficiency and creative interpretation of traditional forms unsurpassed in any other area of Oceania. And it's also uh, been part of the reason why it's been so attractive to anthropologists and uh, art historians. Uh, much of the region uh, is a low-lying plain through which the Sepik River flows with a number of large tributaries. And uh, despite the large number of different cultures and linguistic groups found in the region, there are several characteristics of Sepik cultures that I'll be talking about uh, through the three different examples that I'm going to give. And so, these characteristics are the presence of very large architectural structures called uh, Haus Tamran in uh, talk Pishin again. They're also referred to as men's houses, ceremonial houses, spirit houses. Uh, and I think as I talk more about them, you'll understand why they have these different names. Haus uh, um, as you uh, maybe recognize, has some German in it, uh, as well as some Melanesian, a Melanesian term in it, Tamburan. Uh, Tamburan is uh, a local, in one of the local Melanesian dialects, the term for spirits. So literally, this is a spirit house. Um, so, you find variations on the size and design of these houses throughout the Sepik. Um, again, these are photographs that I've taken over the number of years that I've been um, going back to New Guinea. Um, I didn't do field work in the middle Sepik region, but I did take, um, I went on, uh, I was the resident anthropologist for the American Museum of Natural History on uh, tours um, that the uh, Natural History Museum sponsored to this region of New Guinea. So four or five times I made trips through this area. Um, um, and here is um, a tamburan. Now you'll think, ah, she just said that that means spirit. I mean, how can you have an object that's also called tamburan? This is one of the fascinating things about the ideas, the cultural ideas in this region. Um, people say, uh, men in particular say, because this is an object that women and children are not supposed to see, that the voice of the tamburan is the voice of a spirit, but it's really the men who are playing these flutes, and the performance of the flutes is an important part of male initiation that I'll be talking about. 
related then um, to uh, the performance of the tamburan, our ceremonial dances. You'll see another theme here in the art of this region, uh, that the, uh, many of the things that we see in museums are the decontextualized objects that would have been uh, used in ritual performances, particularly dances. Uh, I've referred already to male initiation ceremonies. This is a very important uh, aspect of these cultures um, that I'll be talking about because much of the art uh, in this region is focused on uh, these ceremonies, on um, uh, the coming of age ceremonies for young men. Uh, and then finally, can't forget that it's a river. Uh, so the important means of transportation are canoes. And canoes, like we talked about with the Kula um, canoes in the Turbian Islands, um, are also imbued. Uh, they're both carved and richly decorated, uh, and they're also imbued with special meaning. So, uh, the lower sea bit, I'm going to um, try to go more quickly so I can get through all this material. This is the region that I know best because I work on Mono Island. So, um, let me go back to this map. And um, Manan is that island right there, almost at the end of the map. Uh, and so it's at the mouth of the Sepik River. Um, but it plays an important role uh, in um, many ideas of people of different cultures of the Sepik region because it's really flat in the Sepik River. And for miles and miles and miles, you can see Manan. This is a, it's a still active volcano, and many of the local um, Monom Island, not the local Monom Islanders, many of the uh, people who live in groups up and down the river believe that their dead, the souls of their dead, go and reside in the volcano. So, um, there is, uh, a distinctive culture area that bounds this lower Sepik region. Um, it's, uh, as I said, the mouth of the Sepik. Uh, is a huge estuary um, filled with mangrove swamps and uh, sago palms, home to a um, group of people uh, who live in what's called the Murug Lakes. Um, then there's also the offshore Schatten Islands, or Schatten Islands. There's my Dutch, this is too good. Uh, but these were uh, first this um, set of islands that Man was a part of. All those little dots along there um, are the Southern Islands. Uh, and then you have the coastal um, groups in the Ramu River, the Karam, uh, up to Angora. Um, these groups are all united through um, exchange, being exchange partners. So they, people have hereditary exchange partners, and there's quite an extensive network of uh, traveling between islands, shore, and rivers. So each of those three areas are different ecological niches. They each have different kinds of product, products that um, they trade with their uh, ceremonial and hereditary exchange partners. Um, so, uh, the most uh, characteristic design element uh, of this lower Sepik region, uh, may be hard to see in this um, slide here, but uh, this is a house post that has a number of figures and masks there. And these uh, are very distinctive. You see, here's a close up of the, uh, throughout this region. So uh, this um, distinctive long-nosed mask, here's another example of it, uh, is found decorating everything from canoes, the house posts that I showed you, uh, individual masks like these, ceremonial uh, logs, uh, slit drums, uh, small amulets worn around the neck or on armbands. Uh, and undeniably phallic in its intention, these long-nosed figures are quintessential uh, representations of male spirits uh, or spirit men, renowned for their bravery, aggression, and seduction of women. 
Although there are objected these uh, object oh, sorry. Let me show you a few more of these and I'll catch my breath. Um, here's one being carved. One thing that I didn't mention, uh, they're also used on objects like this, which is a, a neck rest or headrest. Um, I did, I talked about them being as small amulets. Um, what you can't tell in these pictures is the scale. This one's about five, six inches uh, in height. And not only does it have the characteristic uh, long nose and uh, face, um, but uh, the head uh, dress is also, uh, or the way that the head is treated is also representative of this area. It, re it shows how men used to wear their hair. Uh, in, so their hair would be pulled up into a wicker-like cone with a top knot. And so that's what you see being represented uh, in this. Uh, so, and I mentioned that uh, men would sometimes carry these uh, very small carvings of either the masks or the figures uh, in net bags around their neck. So, what you see in this picture is these bags here, men would have put these little amulets in them, uh, representations either of ancestors, um, good luck charms in hunting, uh, in um, courtship, uh, a variety of different uh, reasons that people, that, that men would carry these figures around. Um, Although there are objectified representations of feminine attributes and female culture heroines, indeed the volcano Mana that I uh, uh, showed you a picture of is believed to be inhabited by a female um, spirit named Zaria, um, and so the ethnography that I've written about Mana is called Zaria's Fire, is the story uh, of this culture heroine and the role that she plays in uh, modern lives. Um, uh, maternal figures and figures representing female sexuality, like Zaria, there are far fewer examples of them in museum collections, um, and in part because um, uh, representations of femininity were often in the form of baskets. So, uh, uh, womb-like uh, representation. Um, as I said earlier, like the Trobrian Islanders' canoes, the canoes of the lower Sepik and offshore islands are an important means of transportation in inner island and north coast trade. Now, although there's no evidence that the intricacy of the carving on a canoe uh, is thought to influence the beneficence of one's trade partner, such as the canoe splash boards that we talked about last week, there is a sense in which both the construction of canoes and their decorations are seen as demonstrations of male success and potency. Mana men, for example, say that men make canoes while women make babies. Similarly, men on the neighboring island of Wogio say that men play the tamaran flutes. That is, they create beautiful and luminous sounds. Sounds that the women that I had mentioned are told are the voices of supernatural spirits. So men are making, uh, playing the flutes uh, while women are making babies. Both examples of male activity, the manufacture of canoes and the performance of the flutes, thus become, in a sense, examples of jealous technologies of enchantment that are demonstrations of distinctly masculine traits that, like childbirth, contribute to the reproduction of society. So men and women are complementary in these societies in terms of their contributions. In the case of the canoes, only men construct them. Women are not allowed to go on overseas uh, sailing uh, voyages. They're not allowed to get into men's canoes. Uh, only men then travel to their trade partners. Uh, interestingly, though, women can have trade partners. <laughs> they can inherit them you know, from their uh, fathers. 
Uh, so women can uh, exchange goods among each other, um, but they don't um, uh, actually travel um, to face to face. Uh, likewise with the flutes, uh, they form a key element in the rituals associated with male initiation and in the past with the transformation of boys into warriors. So the flutes too are symbols of masculine uh, uh, prowess and um, uh, ability to um, provide for the community. Here are some examples of the ways in which canoes are um, decorated. Uh, these are all lower Sepik examples. And you can see, here's, um, <laughs> keep pointing the image I have there, uh, one of these masks that I've talked about, uh, as well as a representation of um, a crocodile. And again, one of the, uh, this is a common motif, the canoe being a representation of the crocodile, as well as having one of the um, ancestor uh, spirit figures. Um, and here is a man, this is a man, a man playing one of the flutes. They're, the flutes, at least in um, uh, Manam and most of the lower sepik, are always played in pairs. Uh, the flutes can be up to six feet in length. One is shorter than the other, so that you get two different pitches. The longer one, perhaps not surprisingly, is called a male. The shorter one is the female. You always need to have a male and a female um, performing together to make music. Uh, another example of this idea of a kind of gender complementarity that you see. And interestingly, um, one of the objects that is um, most uh, uh, elaborated um, in these cultures are not the flutes themselves, but this object, a flute stopper. And flute stoppers are used to literally put in the end of the flute and to store the, when the flute's in storage so that um, mice and dust and other things don't get into the flutes. Uh, and so what you see, and again, is that um, representative um, style, uh, you see the um, supernatural beings. They have different names in different groups. It's uh, uh, Sandam in, in Manam, Sendam. They're variations of the same name in different cultures. Um, here's one that Margaret Mead had collected from the Mandugamore people uh, that's probably the most elaborately decorated of any of them. Uh, and again, uh, what you begin to see is the glorification of the human form, of the male form, uh, of uh, the spirit uh, figures. So, let me just, again, kind of try to wrap up um, quickly. So, in what ways can a canoes, flute stoppers, uh, and masks the, uh, as examples of um, technologies of enchantment. I've talked a little bit about this. Um, one could say that it was the numinous sound of flutes that exemplified them as a technology of enchantment, as they were said to represent the voice of either ancestral or otherwise important spirits. I said that they're um, uh, symbols of male authority as well as male power in general. The fact that uh, it's only men who can play these flutes, that women cannot see the flutes, that only initiated um, uh, males can perform them. These are all ways in which male th authority is being uh, exerted within these societies. Um, in the past, it was said that um, if women saw these flutes, that they could either um, could be killed uh, or raped by the men in the community. So there were sanctions, very heavily violent sanctions against women seeing the flutes. Um, so um, there is another aspect of Jell's theory that I haven't dwelled on uh, up until now, in which he says that um, uh, art objects often have a political dimension to them. And here he was referring to the work of the anthropologist Maurice Bloch, uh, who with reference to the cultures of Madagascar, 
uh, had described both ritual and ritual art as forms of propaganda. Uh, Bloch used the term propaganda, that persuaded people to accept the status quo. With the flutes, too, Sebig men asserted their dominance over women and children, uh, as I said. Uh, in addition to the performance of the flutes, we can see that the elaborate attention given to the carving and decorating the stoppers, um, thus these objects were only seen by the men, those figures that I have been showing you. Um, we can see the attention manifested in these images as reflections of masculine pride and identity, especially in those figures elaborately adorned with feather headdresses and shell ornaments, the heraldic emblems of powerful and handsome male warriors and leaders. The equivalent of, I would say, of miniature Sikhic Apollos uh, or diminutive uh, Davids. So we see here in these objects that um, there's both uh, um, uh, the reflection of ideas of male pride as well as male agency in that these are objects then that men use to, uh, to act in the world. Um, so let me uh, pass on now to, uh, oh, I was going to show you some of the um, drums that uh, are used in uh, ceremonies accompanying uh, male initiation performances. These are the slit drums that I referred to earlier, and then again have the masks uh, either as the handles of the drums or here on uh, the bases of the drums. Uh, so, moving on to the uh, Middle Sepik region, and here is uh, the area that I'm going to be talking about from Angorum you know, up to this uh, other community in Amplenty. Uh, this is the area that is home to um, Yatmul speaking groups. So, uh, the largest group living along the middle section of the Sepik River, most famous. Among anthropologists, perhaps, is the site of research, for, uh, research first by Gregory Bateson and then by Bateson and Mead, and Margaret Mead, in 1938. Uh, the social organization of the Yatmo village, its division into two moieties, um, or groups of clans, is represented spatially within the house Tamaran. So I'm going to be talking um, most specifically here about uh, the meaning of these large house tamaran. Uh, so the house is um, a collective structure. It rep it's used by all of the clans in the village. Uh, and there's an imaginary line that bisects the length of the interior. And one moiety will um, sit on one side. The clans of one moiety will inhabit one side of the structure. The clans of the mo other moiety on the other side of the structure. So space is divided socially and uh, among the different groups. Um, in his 1965 essay, Art and Environment in the Sepik, the British anthropologist Anthony Forge wrote comparatively about the Yatmul and their inland neighbors, the Avalon. He stated that, quote, it seems to me that, and here he was talking about the Avalon, that he said that the Avalon and the Yatmul are very similar. The differences that you see in some of their um, art objects have to do with the fact that one lives in a riverine um, environment and the other in an inland grassland. So, it seems to me that the Avalon uh, slash Yatmul house, these large spirit houses, men's houses, uh, is not just a decorated structure which serves as a setting for ceremonies and displays, but a statement about Avalon or Yatmul culture in society made in architectural terms. A statement that could not be just as well said in words or told in myth. In Forge's terms, these structures were important, perhaps the most important, forms of visual communication in these two societies. So his whole argument was to talk about the way in which these houses functioned as a form of visual communication. So what I'd like to do now is sort of um, go beyond Forge and talk about how um, uh, 
the critique that Gell has of Forge's idea of visual communication. But um, both Anthony Forge and um, uh, Alfred Gell knew each other. Um, I guess I should start by saying I knew both of them when I was at um, the Australian National University. I was based there uh, while I was doing my field work in New Guinea, and they were both there at that time. Uh, and they both had a, a lot of respect for each other. And I, if the two of them uh, could uh, talk with each other now, um, I think that Forge might actually be very interested in what Gel came to write uh, about art. Because as I reread this essay of um, Forge's from 1965, he's struggling to put into words th something that I think subsequent anthropologists who have worked in this area uh, have begun to articulate, and something that Gell's theory of art on agency helps us understand. Um, so Gell says that you know, art isn't just a form of communication, art does something. Okay, so if uh, Forge is saying that architecture uh, is a form of visual communication that we can uh, read uh, as somehow saying something about um, these cultures, and Gell says no, <laughs> it's not just visual communication, these objects, these houses are doing something, then the question is, what are they doing? And that's what I'd like to talk about. What I think is going on in terms of um, these structures, and what I think Forge was actually trying to get at when he says, you know, they're communicating something. Well, I think what they're communicating, to get to the punchline, <laughs> is I think that they are communicating men's power and authority and men's ability to act upon the word, world. So let me, um, uh, I'm going to just, you know, get rid of my talk here and just kind of uh, try to put this all together very quickly so we can wrap up. Um, so, if you think about what I said earlier about the lower secret society saying that men either make canoes or um, uh, play the flutes uh, and women make babies. What you see going on in these societies, and Margaret Mead talked about this very early when she first went and wrote her book, with Sex and Temperament of Three Primitive Societies. What she said is that what you find in these Sepik societies is a kind of male womb envy. So she switched you know, the Freudian um, phallic penis envy idea and said, the, what's going on in these Sepik societies is men are envious of women's ability to make babies. Well, I don't know if we have to agree in saying that they're, you know, that's womb envy, but what I do think you see going on is men grappling with what is it that men can do that's as important to the regeneration of society as what women are doing in making babies. And so I think what you see in Jell's term going on with these uh, large house tambran structures is men are making huge buildings that um, are the dominant structures within these communities. And they're really proud of their ability to do this. And it takes a lot of energy, it takes a lot of commitment, it takes a lot of resources for them to do this. You know, think about architecture in our own city. If we go our cities, if we go back to that image that I showed you at the beginning, you know, of Frankfurt and all those tall bank buildings. I mean, buildings make statements, and so this is the equivalent, you know, of all these high-rise banks in Frankfurt in the Sepik, you know, are these house tambura. So let me um, show you a few more examples of them. Uh, just to give you an idea, and then tell you a little bit, you know, about the symbolism of it. You know, and then I think I'm going to wrap up. <laughs> I was going to talk about the Osman as well, um, but, you know, I think it might be more interesting for us to have, you know, a conversation about some of the things that I've said. So, um, 
Here we have an actual yacht mole house tamburan. Uh, here we have um, another um, middle Sethic group, uh, Blackwater River house tamburan. Um, here we have um, one in Angorum. So you'll begin to see that there are variations uh, on a theme because this area of the river floods. Um, the ha houses are um, built up above um, and you approach them through steps. Um, this last picture that I have is one that I took in the Chambry Lakes where the House Tamaran has now become uh, a center for uh, tourists. Um, they're very interested in seeing these structures. It's where men sell uh, their carvings. Um, and uh, not only uh, do they, uh, these houses have names. They have uh, uh, hereditary names. Uh, uh, but you can also buy a miniature house tamburan right now to take back with you um, uh, to uh, wherever you live as a memento. Uh, so, um, the houses themselves, I mean, interestingly enough, given everything that I've just said about them being representations of male pride and male um, uh, ability, um, the houses themselves are full of female um, iconography. So the house is said to be female. Um, sh the house has um, breasts. It has a mouth. It wears a skirt. You have to enter, you know, through uh, the mouth of, uh, this is a face of a woman. Uh, so, you know, there are some contrad seemingly contradictory things going on with the idea of the house being female. Um, at the same time, we can think of it uh, metaphorically in the sense that uh, it's within this house that young boys are initiated into manhood. And so that... Uh, and literally in both the um, Yatmo cultures and the Ablam, the interior of the uh, men's house is said to be a womb. Um, so it is uh, an enclosed space you know, that uh, is enveloping and uh, a site for the transformation then uh, of men, of boys into men. Um, these faces here too are female faces that are looking out of the house. Um, again, um, this is uh, a house um, that's in somewhat uh, state of disrepair uh, over time. They begin to disintegrate. A new house will be built. But I wanted you to see here um, the carved house posts, uh, very much like the, the one that's here. Uh, in uh, Frankfurt. You can also see that these houses have two stories to them. Uh, this main uh, platform level here is where all of the um, uh, political activity that takes place in a house town goes on. So um, these are sites of um, uh, arguments of village conflict is, is talked about and uh, um, sorted out here. Um, up on the next story, the next level, the second level, is where things like the tamaran flutes are kept, as well as all of the uh, ceremonial uh, dance uh, garb. And um, the other thing that I wanted to show you here is this figure up at the top, which is hard to see, but here's another example of it. This is uh, the female entity of the building, the guardian. Uh, of the structure. And again, you see that uh, uh, this idea of uh, birth is being reenacted with the spread uh, legs. She also has that headdress, the bridal headdress that I had showed you at the beginning. Um, she's wearing a typical Yatmal bride's headdress. In case you've forgotten, <laughs> here's, the, uh, uh, here's an example of one of them. <coughs> Another. What's interesting about these is that um, they're often uh, 
decorated and with the mouth of a crocodile. The Yatmul believed that their ancestors, their totemic ancestor, is a crocodile. Uh, so uh, we see represented in many different forms in uh, uh, crocodile imagery. Um, here is the interior of one of these houses. I said that the floor plan um, divides the down by the commodities. So uh, each of these platforms would relate, would be a seating platform uh, where men of different clan groups within the moiety would sit. Uh, they need to have their own, these are slit drums there. And this number five I want to show you is um, this. Uh, it's the figure of a woman uh, and it's called an orator's stool. So all of the excuse me, yeah, well, men's houses will have some variation in one of these stools. I've got several different pictures here to show you. Um, and this is where when uh, a man wants to stand up and uh, talk, he, no one ever sits in these stools, actually. They're a sign of authority. It's like you're taking the floor. <laughs> Our metaphor in English of taking the floor. Here you'd be taking the stool and you would be uh, uh, occupying um, the space in the center of the men's house and you would be orating, you would be uh, defending your clan, you would be stating uh, whatever uh, your business was, uh, and you would be doing it in the name of the uh, female uh, spirit of the, the guardian of the house, of the men's house. So, let me see where I want to, uh, oh, I'm going to go through a few more slides because I want to talk about um, a couple of aspects of men's uh, roles that no longer um, are of importance that have thwarted masculinity in Yatmo and Avalon society. Uh, this, as you probably recognize, is a skull. <laughs> the Avalon were headhunters in the past. And uh, it was important for men in um, coming of age to have taken a head. Uh, and oftentimes these heads would then be ceremonially covered, the skull, uh, with mud. And they would be decorated with face paint uh, and human hair. Here are a couple of other examples of them commemorating um, the uh, dead. Um, there are two different kinds of skulls that would be taken. One that would be an enemy, and uh, then subsequently as uh, pacification came, skulls would oftentimes still be preserved, but it would be the uh, skulls of uh, important ancestors that you wanted to remember and commemorate. And this is a skull rack that would be found inside the men's house where these would be um, displayed. Um, okay, this next couple of uh, uh, objects um, are again just to show you the importance of the iconography of the crocodile. Here's a, con uh, actually this is a slit drum that was made with a crocodile uh, motif. And here is part of um, a canoe that is disintegrated, but it just kept the uh, canoe crab uh, ornament of the <coughs> crocodile head. I showed you this slide earlier of one of the dance ceremonies where uh, people have, uh, these are men um, who are dressed wearing um, headdresses that uh, signify crocodiles. And this is what I'm leading up to with all of this reference to crocodiles. These are young men uh, who are going through initiation. These are uh, slides that I took about 10 years ago. Um, and there's been a, uh, after a hiatus in male initiation, uh, a period of time in which this was no longer being done, um, there's been kind of a cultural pride and resurgence of um, 
male initiation ceremonies among young men uh, who specifically want to be Mandalan Sipik. They want to be known as a Sipik uh, man who has the virility, the strength to have been scarified. So what you see on um, the chest of these men and here on the back uh, is uh, these the backs and uh, chest of the men have been cut with a razor and uh, blood has been let out and um, it's called uh, making cicatrices having a raised skin this is found in many African societies as well um, and among the yacht wool, this is said to represent the skin of the crocodile. So uh, there are a number of things that are going on uh, symbolically uh, with uh, both the design and then with the transformation of the actual bodies of these young men into representations of their uh, totemic ancestors, the crocodile. Most significantly, what this represents is their ability to endure pain and to become warriors in the past. So, I think what I will do is uh, conclude with my uh, last statement. Uh, uh, lots that I wasn't able to get to, but um, I think what I will end up talking about is uh, the way in which I think that these um, men's houses then represent uh, an aspect of Jell's idea of art doing something. So what I think these houses are doing, and I uh, kind of um, alluded to this earlier, um, was through the elaborate process, and I didn't talk about it, all of what needs to be done in order to actually construct one of these houses um, uh, and the fact that the main um, ridge pole of a house is has male symbolism uh, is that the construction of the house is uh, a demonstration of male pride and of male um, uh, ability to um, construct uh, a lot of structures within the world, as well as a structure that helps, um, is, is the locus for men, boys being transformed into men and in the past transformed into uh, warriors. So, I will end with that and uh, I will leave the Asmat for some other time. <laughs>